Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Steinhardt. I'm the technology editor here at CBS Interactive, and we're very proud to present Building a Future-Ready Organization with Intelligent Automation. This webcast is sponsored by Blue Prism and KPMG. Now, today we're going to talk about the new business realities in the COVID era and how intelligent automation can help. And in order to do that, I'm very excited to welcome Don Roberts, Bruce Mazza, and Benjamin Berkowitz, who are our expert panelists today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, and then I'll run through some very quick housekeeping items before passing the microphone to Don. So Don is Director of Digital Engagement at KPMG. He has more than 14 years of experience focused on intelligent automation across multiple industries. Um, he leads intelligent automation projects and manages them from strategy to execution. He covers vendor selection, proof of concept, requirements analysis, solutions design, process improvement, and implementation of emerging technologies, one of which is robotics pro robotic process automation, RPA, and cognitive solutions as well. So those are very hot topics right now, especially in the COVID era. And we'll also be hearing from Bruce Mazza, who's Vice President of Technology Alliances Program at Blue Prism. So Bruce is responsible for realizing intelligent automation projects. He combines best-in-class capabilities of partners along with Blue Prism's leading RPA platform. He has 22 years of experience in leading alliances, sales, product management, product marketing, and solutions development. And finally, we'll be hearing from Benjamin Berkowitz, who'll be joining us for our panel discussion. Benjamin is Director of Intelligent Automation at Mass General Brigham, which is formerly Partners Healthcare. Now, Benjamin is committed to improving healthcare efficiency and patient outcomes. He's been at Mass General Brigham for 10 years, and he has experience in revenue cycle operations, financial and analytics, and contracting. So Bruce is actually, I'm sorry, Benjamin has actually put this into practice at Mass General. Um, he's been working across the organization to see the, to oversee rather the rollout of RPA tools to eight functional areas. Uh, with the goal of leveraging talent, risk mitigation, cost savings, and revenue enhancement. So I think you'll agree that we have an all-star lineup of experts to talk to us about intelligent automation today. And I want to remind everybody in the audience that this presentation is interactive. So you'll notice that there's an ask a question button on your console. You can hit that question. You can send in questions. I'm sorry, you can hit that button and you can send in questions at any time. Uh, and we'll carve out about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation to address those audience questions. And if we don't get a chance to answer your question live, you'll definitely get a response via email. And you'll also notice a related resources button. You can hit that to learn more about our sponsors and their solutions. With that, I'd like to turn the mic over to Don. Thank you, Michael. Don Roberts here from KPMG. First, I wanna thank everyone participating today. Uh, I say that I hope all is well with you. Uh, your family and your friends in this current environment. Um, I'm excited to speak with you today. Uh, join Bruce from Blue Prism and Benjamin from Mass General Brigham. Uh, share with you what we're seeing organizations react to in this current environment and uh, really future ready their organizations with intelligent automation. Uh, personally, I've collaborated with many clients to bring technology solutions to a variety of business challenges. Um, I also want to share insight to our KPMG team um, and the technologies we support in the market. Um, I think this will provide perspective as uh, we discuss certain use cases today um, and as I contribute to the panel discussions as uh, technologists. So um, in summary, when we look at this content here, our KPMG digital team supports organization solution business challenges of technology. Uh, we do that by combining technical and subject matter expertise with the most relevant and impactful uh, platforms in the market. I'm going to kind of look at this uh, from bottom up real quick, but um, uh, we, we span the spectrum of supporting migration to the cloud, including security and governance. Uh, with data analytics, we're supporting the conversion of data into insights. Uh, we support ServiceNow platform, streamline and automate service delivery models. Um, our intelligent automation team leverages uh, modern automation platforms such as uh, Blue Prism uh, that provide a digital workforce uh, for operational activities. Uh, we also support market-leading low-code platforms um, that really facilitate uh, 
and allow users to build scalable business applications. Um, all the way through machine learning capabilities that allow us to create predictive modeling that can learn from data, identify patterns, and make uh, decisions with minimal human intervention, uh, all the way up to more advanced cognitive solutions. We, uh, we tinker with a lot of uh, third-party and open source uh, platforms, uh, capabilities that can uh, perform tasks that typically involve human intelligence, such as visual perception, uh, speech recognition, or independent decision making. But um, what we found is when um, organizations commit to leveraging technology to transform their oper operations, they're more nimble, they're more informed, uh, they're more prepared for scale, and they're more resilient in time of crisis. Michael, if you don't mind uh, advancing us to the next slide. Thank you. So um, along with my background, uh, uh, the perspectives of Bruce and Benjamin, uh, Benjamin's Healthcare Insight, uh, we're going to share uh, recent trends that we're seeing in the market, um, how various organizations are exploiting technology to solve for these, uh, solve for these unplanned and current events that, uh, that we're all experiencing, and uh, how clients are looking to future-proof uh, and harden and resilient uh, processes. Uh, organizational processes. Uh, but from a professional services vantage point, um, our team, our KPMG team, hasn't, uh, hasn't seen an industry go unscathed. Um, there isn't a client we've spoken to that hasn't uh, desired increased operational resiliency or more capability to provide more timely solutions or insight to operations. Um, the clients we're speaking with um, um, across all industries are working really to, to meet unprecedented challenges they've been faced with. Um, uh, Benjamin, Bruce, and I will share a variety of examples with you today. Um, there's some industry specific, uh, some agnostic of industry, uh, and I'll touch on a couple of those real quick, uh, a couple ag uh, industry agnostic examples and challenges that, uh, that we've seen. But, um, uh, at, at first, it was, it was really the support and enablement of preparing uh, for remote workforce that we've seen across a lot of organizations. Um, many, you know, uh, as we've all experienced, I'm sure, uh, many of our employees have shifted from congregating in offices on a daily basis to working remotely. Um, so now that those employees are unable to kind of directly turn to colleagues or supervisors for operational support or technical help, um, there's, uh, there's just a, a large shift in focus to enabling and streamlining that remote workforce. And I think that's been true of almost everywhere we've looked. Uh, so we, we, we're supporting clients with a lot of virtual assistance in these types of uh, situations. Uh, they've played a valuable role in supporting remote employees, keeping them engaged, keeping them informed, keeping them connected. Um, and, and these virtual assistants can also prompt employees to follow company guidelines, policies, procedures, all in real time. And that's been an interesting glue of connectivity that we've seen. Um, I also would say that uh, agnostic of industry, it's common that we're having conversations right now with IT and IS departments. Uh, those departments are heavily burdened with supporting a, a, this suddenly remote workforce. Um, we're having consistent discussions with these groups about leveraging intelligent automation platforms such as Blue Prism to automate processes, processes that reduce the, uh, I'm sorry, increase the resilience uh, of, of previous manual workloads. Um, automation of processes that can support and facilitate infrastructure for remote work. It's been a big, big focus area that we've seen, agnostic of industry. Um, and automation of processes that uh, um, increase speed and accuracy um, in the current environment, we're seeing these types of solutions freeing up individuals to think about scale and future-proofing. Um, and one quick industry example, uh, specific industry example, I've spent uh, the majority of my career in two industries, kind of the healthcare and life sciences space as well as this TNT, technology media telecommunications. Um, and kind of in the TNT space, we, we, we've had teams supporting some of the largest domestic telecommunications companies really focused on keeping their customers digitally connected. 
So in, in this environment, there's been a dramatic shift uh, in the internet and wireless uses patterns, locations and available bandwidth. Um, we've been talking to organizations about uh, their original wireless and fixed coverage and usage maps that have been turned upside down with remote work. Um, the increased video usage that keeps human connect, humans connected in this environment. Um, and interestingly, the, the heightened video game usage as a result of more free time. Wish I had that free time, but, um, but as a result, we're, we're seeing these organizations leverage intelligent automation to automatically monitor networks, identify and manage bandwidth configuration, um, analyze, identify and analyze peak traffic and new patterns. Uh, you know, really using the, these tools or these solutions as tools to really quickly pinpoint and resolve issues, and provide the best customer experience possible, the best service, and sometimes the best product possible. But in summary, I, I think the current environment has really exposed the challenges organizations have with technology and, and points to the real need for flexible and flexible digital solutions. Most clients are starting to see this will extend beyond the near term and not just solving a problem for COVID-19 uh, that's been caused by COVID-19, but uh, it's an agility they need to be relevant going forward. Um, we'll cover additional examples uh, in our panel and with Bruce uh, and his upcoming slides, but I want to kind of just touch on a couple here. Um, as, as I mentioned, we, we haven't seen an industry unscathed, uh, but there are some unique and interesting Themes across each of these industries I wanted to share here. Michael, you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, I appreciate it. So I wanted to share this slide, um, this graph from a recent uh, Forrester analyst report. This was from about two, two and a half months ago. Um, but this was, I thought this was interesting, kind of tied into our topic here today, but uh, this Forrester report is from one of the more intriguing analysts, I think, in the market. This is uh, Clegg LeClaire, who serves um, enterprise architecture and business process professionals and um, focuses a lot on automation, AI, and the future of work. Um, but in summary, you know, his team's research really stresses that uh, organizations are going to be required to, to kind of remake their intelligent automation roadmap. And that the priority is shifted to automations that enterprises can deploy rapidly uh, at a lower cost, um, support remote execution of business, and um, you know, focus on building resiliency. So I, I, you know, I shared this with you uh, from third-party information. I thought it's kind of really interesting as you look at the, these axes of um, lean operations and cost reduction to prioritization and investment acceleration. Um, because I'm seeing a lot of, or I'm having a lot of discussions in the marketplace that collaborate this analysis, and I wanted to kind of share that as well. Okay, thank you, Michael. And Bruce, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Don. And again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Don talked about this wider lens around intelligent automation of what uh, enterprises around the world are are doing with this set of capabilities now to be more resilient and agile. At Blue Prism, we've been innovating in this area for almost 20 years around the concepts and the reality of a digital workforce. So when you hear the words uh, robotic process automation, uh, that brings to, to mind you know, a robot being pre-programmed to execute a set of tasks which has very much been the case as enterprises have leveraged that technology increasingly at scale. But the, the right way to think about this technology is a digital workforce technology. And as enterprises have had to deal with responding to the pandemic, uh, they've had to shift resources. Don gave the example of the remote workforce. They've had to scale resources in certain parts of their organization and they've had to reduce in others and do so in dramatic fashion. So, you know, in the concept of thinking about resources, you know, the, the, the traditional options were hire more people or offshore, 
And now you have the capability to deploy a digital workforce as a third resource and option. And that can become very strategic, not only from a cost uh, management side, but also from risk management, as well as scaling up uh, customer satisfaction in other areas or business on the front office side. So at Blue Prism, we look at a digital workforce as the uh, third resourcing option that really has now been accelerated uh, with the pandemic. And to put in place a digital workforce, it has to uh, integrate with and be part of this intelligent automation ecosystem where a digital worker is shown in this picture or a digital workforce, but you know, hundreds, tens or hundreds of digital workers can interact throughout the enterprise and it can scale throughout the enterprise to link to back office workflows, those front office workflows or human attended workflows where there's a, a business process, uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that Don talked about that are increasingly providing decision support and decision engines to speed and increase the, the uh, quality of decisions. Uh, the ability to have computer vision where documents are unstructured data, uh, which is still you know, highly prevalent in, in most large enterprises and certainly cross enterprise, as well as the ability to invoke uh, other technologies like natural language processing and virtual agents. So when you combine these technologies and do so in a way that uh, you can architect a, a process uh, map that can be not only repetitive but increasingly cognitive, then you can scale this digital workforce and this third resourcing option. And if you do that, it is uh, a, a, a true uh, ally in the cause of being able to be uh, agile. It operates 24-7. The, the stakes are reduced significantly because you're uh, programming the actions according to a tested workflow. And also, you want to have a, a centrally deployed and managed environment that is fully compliant. And anything that the digital worker does, you want to be able to track with irrefutable logs so that it becomes a secure part of the enterprise. And moving on to the next slide, these are some of the configurations of uh, a digital workforce that many, uh, many in the market have deployed and we've supported. So over on the right side, the unattended, this is where a digital worker can carry out uh, work independently. And these are often back office workflows that are set in some schedule. So think about a, a finance workflow, for example, a month-end reconciliation process or an invoicing process that uh, manages to, to process thousands of uh, transactions over a, a period of time and is accelerated. Those can be deployed centrally and comes with that complete audit and governance log. When you start to look at the workflows that need to include the human workers side by side and have those digital workers assisting the human workers. The configurations are on the far left, the on desktop attendant, and this is where a digital worker shares a uh, login with a worker. And although that's a, con uh, a supported configuration, it's not ideal for a number of reasons, uh, mostly because you would never, if you're hiring a, a worker to help you, you would typically not have them share your computer to do work. Why? Because uh, two people sharing a desktop can provide issues with uh, auditability, compliance, also the, um, the work that's done unclear about whether a robot did the work or a real worker did the work. And so that on desktop attended configuration becomes difficult to scale and it's difficult from a security and compliance uh, side inside of enterprises, which is why we recommend an off the desktop attended environment. And when we refer to that, we refer to a central pool of digital workers that the digital workers look like uh, other employees. They have credentials in the enterprise. They can perform work and interact back and forth with the human workers through many different interfaces, whether that's email, chatbot, web forms, et cetera, 
and they can process the outputs to that workflow seamlessly. And it also means that you can have a more auditable uh, work trail between those digital workers and the human agents. So when we looked at the enterprises that were responding, and as Don said, pretty much every organization, government entity, enterprise, uh, certainly uh, looking forward to hearing from Benjamin in terms of the uh, impact in healthcare and how the response happened. But all across these industries, there is a broad range of impacts and responses. And just want to share a couple of additional examples uh, where uh, customers of Blue Prisms were using the digital workforce to respond. And one of those areas is in the contact center. And contact centers uh, uh, today are very much omni-channel, supporting live calls uh, coming into a pools of agents, as well as other different forms of technology like web forms and email and chat and your mobile device that you can interact with a customer service agent. Well, all, because the, the pandemic meant that people couldn't interact at a branch office or in person, contact centers had dramatic swings and huge uh, increase in customers' uh, interactions, not only because of that fact, but because there was just uh, urgency in whether it was a bank loan or uh, uh, mortgage deferral that they needed, the contact centers had to take the brunt of that change. And meanwhile, those remote workforces or those agent workforces became remote. And so a digital workforce as part of a contact center and substantially help those contact centers scale by removing the complexity of the, uh, the system interactions and reduce the handling time of those calls, as well as those uh, interactions on the virtual agent side by performing work that otherwise would take a human or take some complicated transaction on multiple systems. So we've been working with customers that have had a, a real dramatic improvement in their ability to respond, even with that remote workforce, even with those challenges, sometimes 10x the amount of uh, customer interactions a digital workforce can help them scale and respond and speed the customer uh, resolution time. Another uh, set of examples in financial services, uh, the in the US in particular, but also all across the world, uh, in various different uh, countries, the relief programs that the government's rolled out to support small businesses, such as the SBA PPP program here in the U.S., and other mortgage relief uh, forbearance programs, uh, impacted lenders significantly in terms of new workflows that they had to stand up in days with these new government uh, regulations. And a digital workforce was applied so that we could speed up, dramatically speed up, processing of loans, processing of mortgage forbearance requests, to the point that what was taking sometimes 30 minutes to an hour per transaction could be reduced to one to two minutes. And for those entities that were able to be agile and resilient in that respect, it made a huge difference in their ability to support those government programs and ultimately the businesses and homeowners that were impacted. So it's a... Um, uh, example of that resilience that can be provided in a digital workforce. Again, we'll hear about some more use cases and in the panel discussion. The last thing I want to just uh, share here is a survey that uh, Blue Prism conducts yearly. This survey actually happened in the beginning of the pandemic in March of this year, where we surveyed almost 7,000 uh, business users as well as uh, decision makers about the use of intelligent automation in their enterprise. And I'll just highlight a few things of, of interest. The, uh, the fact is that the digital workforce is here, it's upon us, and 92% of decision makers believe uh, that intelligent automation is uh, ready to extend across their organizations and that RPA is an important part of that digital transformation. Uh, journey. So most enterprises are ready or starting, maybe you're piloting the technology, 
maybe the pandemic has actually highlighted the need uh, to implement it faster or scale it larger inside the organization. Um, but the other thing is that 81% of decision makers believe that RPA is not just about time and cost savings. And I do think this was one of the more dramatic shifts in thinking, whereas before RPA was thought to uh, drive time and cost savings, which it still does, but now it's being considered inside of a strategic impact of risk mitigation and scaling customer interactions and improving those customer interactions that has an impact on the ability to respond, to provide service, and ultimately customer satisfaction. So with that, I'll uh, hand it back over to uh, Don uh, to take us in the panel discussion. Thanks, Bruce. Michael, if you will mind, uh, progress to slide 11. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you, Don and Bruce. And uh, I'm also excited to bring on Benjamin Berkowitz, who's Director of Intelligent Automation at Mass General Brigham, for our panel discussion portion. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got some questions here for the panelists, and I would also encourage the audience to send in your questions using the Ask a Question button on your console. But let's jump right in. Um, where is your organization in its IA journey, and how is it being viewed or possibly changed given the current environment? I think we'll start with, uh, with Benjamin, and we'll get some color commentary from Don and Bruce as well. Yeah, great, and uh, really happy to be here with everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining. We have been down this RPA path uh, for just about uh, two years. Um, we spent the first year doing some pilot and getting things set up, and I'd say the last year we've really accelerated um, our uh, program, our RPA program through PRISM, um, and now are very much in sort of a expansion mode here. So I think um, we are well positioned, or have been well positioned, I should say, um, to tackle any problem that's essentially thrown at us uh, <laughs> utilizing Blue Prism. Our original view is to slowly grow um, over time. Um, as I mentioned uh, or mentioned in the beginning, we had we have about eight departments live with uh, some sort of automation. Uh, throughout our administrative services areas uh, central to uh, Mass General Brigham. Um, and we were looking to expand to hospitals and their administrative services um, and to other areas. Um, it's actually changed a little bit now, given the current environment with COVID. Um, many organizations, hospitals included, are facing some really challenging financial situations. And for Mass General Brigham, um, we are in a very unique position being a healthcare company, you would think that uh, healthcare hosp uh, hospitals would be, you know, overflowing with patients, and that's true. Uh, they are, unfortunately, overflowing with patients related to COVID. Sort of the bread and butter revenue that comes into our system um, have been staying at home for obvious reasons. Um, so we're actually looking to leverage RPA uh, in various different ways. And in particular, to, uh, to really evaluate where we can be more efficient. In, in our particular case, what co the COVID challenges have, have shown us is, is really where we're efficient. And we were very great in finding ways to be efficient to stand up Boston Hope, which was a standalone hospital um, shared by the city of Boston and surrounding areas to change our floors from non-ICU to ICU floors. But all of those were done very quickly on the fly. And um, other administrative processes around that really highlighted where we could be more efficient uh, in terms of how we do our work. And our leadership is really looking to RPA now um, to help us be more efficient in those, those areas, particularly transactional um, areas, but also um, in sort of auditing uh, compliance and financial reconciliation areas where there's just a tremendous amount of time uh, utilized in collecting data or formatting data or getting it ready for analytics. Um, so I think we're well positioned as we look to the, uh, <clears throat> to the future and what the environment is going to throw at us. And I'll knock on wood and hope that there isn't a second wave. But I think we're we're in a great position to to continue to expand the. Program. 
I think I'm handing it off to Don. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to um, add some professional services perspective to this question. Um, had the opportunity to be along the ride for uh, the intelligent automation journey for a variety of organizations. Um, so I've been exposed and retained to support a variety of um, digital transformation initiatives. So I've seen the spectrum. Um, I feel like years ago it was piloting certain technology, um, technologies, usually of lower automation capability or lower on the automation capability curve. Um, you know, siloed and pocketed rules-based automation initiatives here and there. And that quickly grew into um, acceptance, adoption, and acceleration of integration of these platforms. Um, uh, you know, we typically see a lot, like I mentioned, a lot of siloed efforts. Uh, for instance, we'll, we'll see how to back office business units, perhaps spearhead um, automation in one form or another, while front office might be implementing more customer-facing solutions or virtual chat solution. And, and they're not um, holistically you know, targeting the technologies across the enterprise. They're not working together to you know, cart around a toolbox of tools to um, truly use them as tools and not point solutions. Um, but I also feel like the pandemic's really exposed um, a lot of companies and their lack of agility. Um, and, and I think it resulted from this splintered and slow approach of adoption. Um, we've been talking about it for a long time. Um, we've talked about it for years about the need for digital transformation, um, the, the, the strategic approach of it, and, and, and not the short sightedness of um, just time and cost savings, but uh, the speed of transformation be quick and agile. Um, but it's only now in 2020 where we're. Um, under a pandemic stress of operations that we see how essential it is for business to kind of live up to that talk and and, and truly leverage these tools. Um, so we've seen episodes this year where truly the fate of operations for some clients depend on being able to create a new application at times, um, adopt new patterns of behavior, uh, and automate uh, operational support tasks. Yeah, I'll add to that, Don, just from a yeah, just from a from a vendor perspective, a couple of things that we see from our point of view in terms of how customers are wanting to consume the technology. Increasingly, they want to consume a cloud-based deployment that's uh, you know SaaS deployed because of that agility and scale that they can get and the speed of deployment. So, you know, we have a an option for a SaaS-based deployment uh, that. You know, certainly during the pandemic and now afterwards, I think many organizations are reevaluating or accelerating their evaluation of a cloud deployed option because of that resilience. And the other part of it is just in terms of the larger intelligent automation stack, uh, organizations realize that to combine those technologies uh, that we talked about before, and you highlighted early in the presentation, Don, they need capabilities that are out of the box ready. So pre-built capabilities, pre-built connectors, like the ones that uh, we've you know, engaged and built on our digital exchange, and certainly KPMG has uh, done as well, so that customers can not only think agilely, agile about what they need to do that may be immediate, but also implement those workflows, literally with drag and drop capabilities to, uh, to these new technologies. All right. Thanks, Michael. I think we're ready to the next slide, to, uh, move, move to the next one, absolutely. So continuing on that uh, topic of agility and sort of being able to turn on a dime, what are organizations doing to pivot their operations? So, so I can kick this off. Um, one, one interesting sure. component of what's happened during COVID is, as I'm sure we're all familiar, is we sent all of our workforce home. Um, what what was really interesting for us is that the uh, all of our bots um you know they are kind of worked from home they are, they continue doing their work um without any without skipping a beat which i think was really uh a test to the this 
uh, technology really helping helping us out during this really challenging time. As we're continuing to look um, forward uh, to Bruce's earlier point, uh, we are now recognizing the need for um, additional solutions to be able to uh, facilitate or to complete processes a little bit more OCR technology um, to help us um, alleviate some of the stress that our teams are feeling. And that was part of the reason why uh, we went, when we did our vendor uh, evaluation, we went with Blue Prism because we knew one day we're going to reach that point where uh, additional resources are going to be needed for us to continue down the automation path. Um, and we're starting to reach that, that tipping point now. Um, I think we're also pivoting in ways of really thinking, you know, people mention digital workers and they mention, um, you know, automating a process. And I think we're really getting to a tipping point within our organization of thinking not just, oh, I want to automate this process, therefore alleviating work from people who are doing it now um, or taking over those repetitive mundane tasks, but really leveraging our digital workers to do work that we don't have resources to do or don't want to hire resources to do. And we have some use cases of that already where we have deployed a, a, a digital worker to do the work of 10, essentially 10 people that we didn't have to hire for. Um, and uh, that's been quite a successful project. Um, in addition, I think we're also looking to do some insourcing. Uh, you know, a few years back, outsourcing was all the rage. Typically, a lot of, uh, for us, a lot of the transactional outsourcing that we did back then um, is very easily transferable to an automation or a bot to do. And so we're exploring all of our contracts with our vendors and the types of processes that they have to see if we can insource some of that um, and help with um, cash flow that way as well. Uh, Don, anything to add? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry Bruce. Yeah. Bruce. Um, no, no, it's fine. Uh, go ahead, Bruce. I'll chime in. i got to pick on the manufacturing industry. Yeah, uh, I think, Benjamin, your outline there was, was spot on with what we're seeing with other customers, too, that they're not – the pandemic has put in place this need to have new processes and new ways of interacting inside the enterprise with employees and with customers that never existed before, and that's created this – this higher speed of momentum to look at just not automating existing processes, but rethinking the processes to be digital first. And uh, that is that transition um, opens up new, not only new staffing uh, models, but also, again, improvements in how uh, customer interactions and outcomes actually happen. So that's a big, I think, a big pivot in operation. John? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, so manufacturing, you know, we're seeing a wide uh, array of manufacturers embarking on major pivots, um, pivots away from their, you know, their, their core competency or their you know, um, daily offerings of products um, and shift towards products of necessity. So I think about like um, a, lot large, a lot of uh, large auto manufacturers um, a lot of uh, a lot of organizations uh, shifting pivoting towards manufacturing of ventilators, masks, gown shields, uh, non-traditional product that uh, companies have previously focused on, whether uh, requested or required by the federal government or um, out of uh, uh, profits. Um, but. Uh, I, I think as this pandemic is going to continue, we're going to we're going to continue to see that shift um, in, in products um, beginning to to creep up on different industries. Um, you know, core to the bank in this environment, um, they they feverishly pivoted to the facilitation and distribution of loans to small businesses in the uh, payroll protection program. Um, the technologies they've implemented there, um, the banks that we're talking to, they've created a lot of agility uh, needed to administer those time-sensitive services, um, trying to get uh, money out to these businesses to keep their uh, employees employed, um, leveraging 
uh, robotic process automation, uh, low code platforms, um, app development platforms like Appian and Uncork, and uh, RPA orchestration capability like the Prism. Um, um, we continue to we continue to have conversations uh, with these organizations about using these technologies as as, as a tool uh, to solve or contribute to the solution of business problems across the enterprise, um, and not just a siloed point solution or a cost takeout play or a time takeout play. Uh, to usually go hand in hand, but um, you know, talking to companies that are starting to creatively use uh, these technologies across the enterprise to uh, reduce operational risk. Um, Stepping back and considering intelligent automation as a, as a true change to the enterprise, a, a true transformation of operations. Um, but um, the pivots that we've seen organizations take are, are uh, encouraging. They're they're impressive. Um, they're very technology driven. Um, but uh, the, the organization's got to be committed to the change. And I think that's been a, a, a somewhat of a barrier over the last three to five years and uh, the impotence of, of, of the current environment has really um, prioritized that type of change and adoption. So um, it's an interesting pivot that we see uh, from our vantage point. And uh, um, I think it's one that's going to continue to validate the, the value of these types of solutions. All right. So, Benjamin, turning the conversation back to you, um, how has automation helped your organization and or organizations in general prepare better or be in a better position to handle situations like this? Yeah, thanks, <clears throat> for me. Um, You know, just as background to the group who's listening, and, you know, I'm not an IT uh, professional, I come from the business. Uh, as I mentioned, I was in analytics before, um, contracting in various other places. And for us, what we've done at Mass General Brigham is set up a structure um, where the majority of our developers were like me, um, coming from the business or embedded within our business units. And so that's put us in a really unique situation where as the situation as and throw, flows through different departments, they're able to deploy resources um, to automate uh, co different components of their business. And so we did that very consciously and on purpose because what we felt was really important uh, was to empower departments to deploy automations where they saw it most necessary. So by way of example, you know, during the height of the COVID surge here in Massachusetts, we had developers within our HR department redeploy one of their automations to provide daily reporting on COVID. Another uh, department, our finance department, redeployed an automation because of changes um, in the CARES Act of how they were reporting and reconciling data, and they needed to make that change uh, to adjust to that. So I think it's made us extraordinarily agile and nimble to not only deploy automations, but to adjust them. Um, as, as the situation came um, in hand. As COVID has slowed down and things are coming back to a newer normal and as our organization is able to focus internally a little bit more ra rather than you know all hands on deck at our hospitals, um, <clears throat> having the developers really embedded in those the departments is enabling these de the, those departments to prioritize and accelerate um, build with those. Additionally, we have a centralized team under that works under me um, that can also help accelerate um, automation builds in any of those departments that are alive and certainly helps onboard uh, additional ones. So I think that flexibility as well as the turnaround time of an automation going live start to finish, you know, could be anywhere from eight to 15 weeks, depending on complexity, has made us very uh, nimble uh, these days, as opposed to something like a large PI or process improvement project, uh, which could take anywhere from three to six months, and depending on their complexity. We want to come in and out of a department or in and out of a project uh, as quickly as possible. So, um, so I think our structure 
has really helped automation, um, helped us be prepared to, ha to have automations handle this uh, very unique situation. On to uh, Don. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so the main thing I think about um, how automations help is with agility and, and speed of response. Um, strategically talking to some clients and supporting the creative redirection of currently integrated automations uh, that Benjamin was mentioning, um, or uh, the creative thought process of targeting certain solutions in, in different areas not previously considered, uh, perhaps due to other prioritizing benefits. But um, um, we've seen our, our more digitally adopted organizations be able to respond to change more timely. Um, you heard some great examples from Benjamin. Uh, and they're doing it with less effort uh, than those that have failed to scale or failed to adopt. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen a lot of very interesting uh, app developments on low-code platforms. I've seen a lot of progress with the integration of multi-tool solutioning. Um, so I, I think a lot of examples with uh, OCR, optical character recognition, ingestion capabilities, um, pulling in content into systems that are facilitated across different data sources uh, with uh, robotic process engineering platforms that are also coupled with machine learning. So I, I see the I see the I see more tools being collected um, and solutioned with together. Um, and and I think the, the, the those companies that have figured out how to do that. I don't think you always you know, get to an end state, but um, the, the most mature organizations with kind of the most tools to work with, I think have really been able to creatively uh, minimize impact uh, in certain areas. Um, but in summary, it's consistent theme that we see. Uh, the organizations that are further along the adoption curve, further along in enterprise scale and democratization of the, the tool usage, uh, the more prepared they've been to, to handle the situation. And Don, I'll add one more element to that. We also uh, have seen that organizations that are thinking outside their boundaries, particularly in healthcare, government agencies, uh, the, the complexities of having inter-organizational or inter-enterprise uh, you know, the sharing of data, uh, no doubt, have been highlighted by the pandemic more than ever. Um, so as an example, in uh, in the UK, the National Health Service is a big user of Blue Prism. They have over 50 different trusts that are leveraging Blue Prism, but they're doing that in a way that is sharing data across enterprise and organizational boundaries, sharing uh, everything from not only the data, but um, the ability to create workflows that are cross-organizational. And that has been really substantially important for response. Um, and those touch points in, in between enterprises are typically done uh, by human workers. So when the systems are stressed, uh, those are key areas for automation. And um, you know, I think I think that's part of the strategy that organizations will think about next is not only their inter intra enterprise view, but their inter uh, organizational or enterprise view uh, where they need that, either the suppliers or other agencies that they need to work with. And there's big breakthroughs that can be made there in terms of um, automation speed and resilience. All right. Back to you, Mike. Moving on to our next, moving on to our next question. Um, has automation been emphasized or de-emphasized during this time? I mean, there's there's a lot of upheaval and uh, a lot of operational changes that have to happen very quickly. Um, so sort of how, what's the status of an automation rollout during this period? Benjamin, uh, you want to chime in? And, you know, yeah, yeah, you want me to go off. first? Um, you no, know, I'm, I'm happy to start. So uh, what was interesting, so our, we had a pretty robust pipeline into COVID-19. Um, and Master Neural Brigham, and we sort of continued that work um, while the hospitals were uh, overwhelmed with patients and, and our administrative services were uh, working through that really challenging time. So I don't think it was ever de-emphasized, uh, but 
certainly the emphasis that's uh, being put on this technology now in, in intelligent automation in general is uh, reinvigorated, I would say, after the fact, as I mentioned before. We're really looking to utilize this technology and other automation technologies to streamline part of the processes that either we've created sort of on the fly um, to be able to handle the, the challenges that we face um, or places where we recognized uh, the process was really um, being slowed down by various different steps that could be automated. So um, I, I would say our leadership reinvigorated um, and is doubling down on automation, uh, particularly RPA, um, as we look over the next several years how best to uh, to deal with the waters that are coming, whether they're choppy or smooth, uh, but to just be more more efficient um, in what we do in our back end processes and our back end offices. Yeah, I'll add to that. Um, I, you know, I've got an opportunity to observe market trends in various industries, and while. Uh, you know, my, the vast majority of my conversations are centered around technology. So I'm a little bit subjective to this, but um, I, I would say the, 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 the conversations have increased overall. Um, I've, I've seen some de-emphasis on initiatives in general at some organizations um, as they've paused to collect themselves and reprioritize capital. Um, uh, I've seen increased emphasis placed on digital point solutions. Um, I think that's typical in a time of crisis is to point a technology or multiple technologies at a business challenge, um, you know, solve the sensitive business challenges in a timely, timely manner. Um, you know, overall, I, I think the, the sentiment I feel in the market is, is more reassessment of investment um, for digital solutions, kind of an emphasis of requirement, um, a, a realization that siloed initiatives are not going to get organizations where they need to be. Um, I, 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 think, uh, I think back to the, the Forrester research we touched on earlier in the conversation, um, and, I, and I do believe through my conversations and what that research has shown is a, uh, that the priority has shifted um, to tools that um, enterprises can solution with rapidly and at lower cost and, and truly build resilience for the, the next disruption. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of dialogue, we're having a lot of dialogue around digital change, digital automation, intelligent automation, across the spectrum of capability. Um, but uh, we're seeing emphasis on being able to build applications in weeks and not months. Um, and they want to be able to build it once and deploy it everywhere. Bruce, you want to add to this any? I think you summarized it really well, uh, Benjamin and Don. Okay. Awesome. Great. Uh, so I will point out that we're heading into the home stretch, but we still have a couple of questions left. Um, Benjamin, starting with you, can you share some of the top lessons you've learned about the role that automation plays in operational resilience? Um, well, I would say in terms of resilience, I love the fact that our automations, um, you know, they don't sleep, they don't take vacations, uh, they don't get COVID-19, um, so they can, they're able to continue to work um, regardless of uh, what what the situation is in the, in the office or, or now in the virtual office. Um, I also think, <clears throat> I'd also add that a top lesson here um, is that, uh, and I think it was mentioned earlier, you know, the, because we've built so many um, automations now, the reusability of components of it really helps accelerate um, the creation of new automation. So, for example, you know, we are, for those of you who may know healthcare, um, our electronic medical record system is Epic, and we've created essentially a library of epic related processes and objects that we can reuse so that every time we're starting to build something new with with epic we don't have to start from scratch um, that we're able to reuse components that we've done before and because of that and as applications upgrade from time to time 
And we're only changing the object. We don't necessarily have to change the entire process to be able to have the same automation run time and time again. So that, that piece of resilience has been really key for us um, to be able to sell sort of the overall RPA program to the organization and then prove that uh, we can reduce build time um, as our libraries get larger and larger. I'd also say there's, there were some unintended positive consequences um, to RPA um, that help show, show resilience. So for example, one of our automations checks licensures for a variety of different um, licenses, um, and in particular nurses. And because this automation can do more work than a person could, um, we're able to check licenses more frequently. But one of the unintended consequences of the positive light is that we've never had someone show up to work with an expired license and then had to be turned away and someone would have to be called in um, to cover for that individual. And so while that didn't occur frequently, thankfully, in the past, um, it now never occurs. And so as you're thinking through how does automation impact your organization, the increased throughput or the increased uh, working hours that an automation can do, checking multiple times in a day, or um, you know, <clears throat> doing extra steps that you didn't uh, you didn't have someone doing beforehand, um, are all possible and possible benefits um, for operational resilience, so that you you can perform at a higher level. On to you, Don. Yeah, um, so I'll add a couple things here. Um, I think the top lessons we've learned is that many of these organizations have been exposed, somewhat flat-footed uh, as it pertains to their ability to, to respond quickly um, and scale the response, um, not necessarily prepared with the right technology. Um, you know, other top lessons, I think, and, and some of these are enhanced by the, the current environment. Some of them are agnostic to this pandemic. Um, but uh, um, the criticality of enterprise integration of platforms in an organization is just people don't think about the engine that creates the solution. They think of the resiliency of the process, the speed of the process, the fact that they're not performing the process or they're getting better insight from it. Um, and just the, the importance of integrating these tools strategically um, in a governed way, uh, set up for scale and democratization of use, depending on the tool. Um, I, I, I'd say other, you know, there's some, um, I've seen a lot of aha moments with previous cultures of resistance of change. Um, I, I'm seeing kind of you know, talking to some regional banks, there's, there's a certain culture, there's a certain logic, there's a certain speed at which they move with adoption of technologies or conversion to modern ERP platforms. But um, um, I, I'd, I'd say the, the importance, and so I'll just kind of cap this off with the importance of targeting these tools strategically, understanding the capability, their integration capabilities, um, and targeting them towards critical systems and support. Um, I think just as equally as important as building a solution of work is building the right solutions um, and um, solving for things holistically despite their fragmented uh, challenges they present uh, sub-business units or various hospitals across the uh, uh, healthcare chain like uh, Mass General and Brigham. But um, I think there's a lot, I think we will all going to continue to learn coming out of this. I think there's a lot to learn. Um, but I, in summary, I would say that uh, um, those that are going to learn the most and, and get them and get the best out of what can can be accomplished are going to be using these intelligent automation platforms creatively um, and strategically. All right. Well, you, uh, I really appreciate the time. Sure. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say. I think we're out of time. But uh, back to you, Michael. I. Uh, I know we're uh, right at the top of the hour here. Right, I thought well, this is Don so Roberts. Of, uh, 
I've also noticed a couple of questions to come through. I apologize for paying attention towards the presentation, and, and, I'll, and I'll be sure to reach out to each of you that inquired uh, with questions. We kind of ran in through the, the Q&A part, uh, but appreciate everyone's uh, ear, um, and I uh, hope everybody does well, stays well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's Don Roberts and Bruce Mazza and Benjamin Berkowitz, who really we really appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, and uh, as Don mentioned, uh, those of you who did send in questions, we apologize that we didn't get to address them live, but we will definitely respond via email. And if you happen to be watching this on demand, you can also feel free to send in your questions at any point. So with that, I'm going to thank our sponsors, Blue Prism and KPMG. I'll encourage everybody to click the Related Resources button to see what else you can learn about RPA and intelligent automation. And I'll remind everybody that this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing in approximately 48 hours from now. So if you'd like to pass your link along to colleagues, you can feel free to do that as well. My name is Michael Steinhardt for CBS Interactive, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.